Okay, so good afternoon. Welcome to this course on optical engineering. Um, this is a course offered for MTech students and UG students, and we'll see why it's important to learn this subject for people who don't have a basic optics degree. But before I go into any specifics of the course, I want to start with a question. Okay, I have a system here, an optical system here that I'm representing through an analogy. The analogy is that you have something in the system that is moving at a fairly high velocity and it has to move very accurately. So the numbers that are given here for the height. So I'm, I, in my analogy, something is moving and in my analogy, I'm calling that an aeroplane. It's moving with a velocity of 5,000 kilometers per second. I've given numbers for the height it is above the ground and these blue arrows 1.6 kilometers horizontal and 5 kilometers vertical indicate the accuracy with which it has to maintain this height uh, keeping in mind it's moving at this velocity can you tell me what you think this optical system is it's a system not an element not a device it's a full system I know you have at some point of time used it. I should add that the system is already a little bit old technology. We have moved on to newer technology. So it is not something that you would be using currently, but I am very sure you have used it. You might even own it. So it is not, I am not talking about a technology that is far away from everyday life and it's not some complicated, sophisticated technology. Give you one more clue. The path that is moving, the path along which the object is moving is not a straight or linear path, but has this spiral nature as shown in this figure here. Maybe this figure gives you a clue as to what I'm talking about. No? Okay. So, I'm talking about a CD system, a CD player, a DVD player. I'm sure you have one on your laptop, right? So how do I read? So the question is, what? How is how is a CD or DVD similar to this analogy of an aeroplane moving at this velocity? How does one read or get information from a CD or a DVD player? Now the system has several parts to it. One, it has the disk which contains the data that is to be read. And of course there is the what we call the pickup head which reads the data. And I could go a step further and say I can also write with my player. So I could have a head that is used for writing on a CD. Let us stick with the first part. We have a disk which has information on it and we want to read information. How is that information read? The pickup head has a source of light in it and it sends the light onto the disc. The light reflects off the disc and somehow in that reflection information has been transferred. So that reflected light now carries the information. How does it translate to this analogy? Well the disc is not stationary. The disc is spinning and it is moving at a certain velocity. There are tracks, so if you if you look, so often people get the clue, get the answer by looking at this because this gives them the idea of a CD. There are tracks and as you are reading information from one track, you the beam of light should not accidentally move on to the next track because then you would be getting the wrong information. So the disk is spinning at a certain velocity and at that velocity, the beam of light has to accurately stay on this track. Now I have been using the word CD or DVD interchangeably over here, but there is a difference between the two of them. What is the obvious dis difference between a CD and a DVD? So okay, the way in which data is stored is one difference, but if I had to say the prime difference 
is the amount of data that is stored, right? A DVD has a lot more information. Now, that might be partly because the coding techniques have involved, have evolved, but it is also to do with the optics and the technology, the hardware of the system. So, the tracks in a DVD are spaced much closer. So, the tolerance, what the error in how much the beam can move is much tighter. And that's where the analogy comes. If you ramp up these numbers, and here in this second column, you have the numbers for the CD. If you ramp up the numbers, you can get to the numbers of the analogy of the plane. So it's moving at a linear velocity of 1.2 meters per second. There's a lens that focuses this beam of light to a spot that is incident on the track that is being read. All this time, this disk is spinning, but the spot has to stay correctly on that track. And if there is an error, and there will be some error, that error is of course only allow, uh, given up to the spacing between the tracks. If the focus changes, the focal position changes, the beam is focusing on this layer, but if the focal position changes, you go a little too high or below, then the reflected light does not go back with enough power. So again, you are going to lose data. So if you ramp up these numbers of the CD, then you get to the analogy of the plane. Okay? And if I actually unspiral a CD, the track of the CD, a CD would have 5 kilometer length of data and it is much more for the DVD. Okay? So this is how the analogy comes about. Now, Many times when I ask this question to students, they do not come up and say the answer is this. And sometimes it is because as you had mentioned that maybe the analogy of the plane is not clear. But for many students, they do not think of this as an optical device. So when I say give me name of an optical system, you do not think of a CD player as an optical system. Right? And this is I do not know whether I should say unfortunately or not, but this is the role optics plays. It plays a very important role in many, many different systems and um, systems and devices that we use today, but it is always playing part of the role. It is very rarely that you have a purely optical system in today's world. Now, our world would be completely different today if we took optics out of it. Because if I took optics out of it, I would remove the entire fiber optic network. And that would change everything, right? Again, people use the internet. Everyone is on the World Wide Web. But very few people are thinking, because of optics, this is possible. So this is really one of the reasons why this course is so important because optics is there everywhere. It's subtly sitting there in many, many devices. Some of them may be purely entertainment and you might, some people might say unimportant. We can argue about that, but it's there in many, many systems that are very, very important, crucial life safe. Okay? And I'll Come, I like the analogy of the CD. I like talking about the CD player because I am an optical engineer. I will pull up the CD player and say this is an optical system. But I know it is not purely an optical system. You would not have a CD or a DVD player if you did not have good developments in mechanical engineering. The whole system had to be shrunk down, made small. A CD player, do you know how many motors it has in it? has three motors, yes, because you have one that slides out the tray onto which you put the device, it has one that spins the CD and it has one that moves the head up and down. So you have three motors. Now those motors have to be extremely small, they can't send out a lot of noise, they can't be send out a lot of heat. So there, there's a lot of development that went into designing these very small, very efficient motors. So there's developments in that technology, there's developments in mechanical engineering. The CD itself, you have to be able to write onto the CD, it has to last th 
through time. You need to have CDs that are writable CDs. So there is a lot of material technology that has gone into it. There is a whole lot of electronics and we are talking about using light. Now the original lasers were big devices. Now we use semiconductor lasers. So that entire technology had to develop to build semiconductor lasers and to make them cheap when manufacturing in large numbers. So there are many, many different fields that have gone into it. A CD has this ability that if part of the CD is damaged or scratched, it doesn't immediately mean you've lost all your data. So there's a lot of redundancy in the way the data is put there. So there's a lot of work that's gone in the algorithms that convert data into data that's stored on the CD. So all these fields were necessary to make this compact device. Now while today's world we may not be using CDs or DVDs all that much anymore, a lot of that technology continues in various other optical systems that are relevant today. So it's a very, very nice system to study from the point of view of an engineer. It doesn't matter whether you're coming from a chemical engineering background, a mechanical engineering background, an electrical engineering background, or you're coming from it as a physicist. Right. So that's why I like that system. But having said that, I can come to a more modern system. This is, however, just an image of the CD player just to make it clear to you. So. This is what I was talking about. You have to have a compact light source, the laser diode. You need optics that redirects, maybe reshapes this light, sends it on to the disc which is spinning, and then a photo, the reflected light. And later on in this course, you'll see how information is transferred from the disc to the reflected light. It's not just reflection, there's something else that's happening there. And of course, that is detected by a photo detector. And all the processing happens finally on an electrical signal, not an optical signal. Okay? And those arrows just show you the path of light, the onward and then the return path of light. Okay. Now coming to something that is more relevant in today's world, the smartphone. Everybody has a smartphone, if not a couple of smartphones, right? Where's the optics in a smartphone? camera okay in fact many of the new phones have two cameras three cameras a front camera two reverse cameras what else the LCD screen yes screen yes oh you mean yes there is a sensor well that might not always be optical the so you're talking about the sensors when you raise the phone to answer a call it switches off deactivates the screen that need not always be optical that may not be optical in fact it may be a capacitive the sensor uh, that's not typically optical uh, you have the flashlight the flash that is used and of course what is also important is you you the camera has all its lenses so they have to be fairly good quality you can get very good images from a smartphone camera and you need this is not the wafer level optics and packaging. There's a lot of optics that has goes into the machines and systems that are used to fabricate and assemble the smartphone. So it's not on the phone directly, but without that, you wouldn't be able to have your phone manufactured. So there's a lot of optics that goes into a smartphone. And again, if you typically ask somebody, is this an optical device? The first answer might be no. I wouldn't think of this as an, an optical. Think of it, maybe it's a communication device. You wouldn't think of it as an optical device. But today's world, the phone is used nearly for everything other than having an audio phone call, right? And if you took all the optics out of your phone, I am sure most people today wouldn't be happy with that device. They would say, give me back my phone with all those other utilities in it. And most of those utilities are using optics in some way. Okay? So I am giving these two examples, the DVD player and the smartphone, just to show you the importance of optics. Now, if you are watching this course or sitting in this class, it means you already had some interest or some idea that there is a need to learn optics. So maybe I don't need to convince you. right? But as we go along in the course, you might ask yourself, what's the need to learn all of this or what's the need to learn it in this detail? 
and you can see in the two examples that I've given, if you knew only optics, you wouldn't be able to come up with these systems. In fact, if you knew any one subject alone, no matter how well you knew it, you wouldn't be able to develop these systems. Both these examples are very, very interdisciplinary in nature. And that's where you will find optics. You will find optics in systems and in experiments which are very interdisciplinary in nature. So why do you need to learn optics? You might say, well, I'm an electrical engineer. I'm a mechanical engineer. I'll work with somebody who has this skill. Let that person do the optics. I'll do my bit and we'll do the work together. How do you communicate with somebody who of a different skill? Learning the, the content of this course will allow you at least to understand what that person is saying or for you to communicate your needs in your field but in a better way. You, your expectations will be more realistic because you understand what is possible in optics. So the communication would become better and hopefully that means the collaboration will become better. Okay? So that's why it's important to learn optics. And what do we do in this course? This course actually has only a few lecture hours a week and a lab associated with it. So we don't have a lot of time to do theory. So we restrict ourselves to some very, very basic theory, which is m more than adequate to explain a lot of the systems and to explain a lot of the optics in many, many applications that we use today. We will start with geometric or it's also known as ray optics. We'll then go to Gaussian beam optics. So Gaussian beam is a kind of beam that typically emerges from a laser. And we'll see how this is different from the concept of geometric optics. We'll move from geometric or ray optics to the wave picture. We know that light can be observed or studied in different ways, thought of as having different behavior. So in the ray picture, we don't consider the wave nature of the light at all. We will move to the wave nature of the light when we study interference and diffraction. And then we'll spend the end of the course looking at different systems. Okay. And I've put down a list here. It's not a comprehensive. We may do more than this. We may do some extra things. Okay. In the lab part of the course, we will spend a good part of the course learning an optical design software. It's called Oslo, Optic Software for Layout and Optimization. So you will learn how to design lenses and mirrors to carry out a certain function. We will then do simulations using the software MATLAB or Python for carrying out interference and diffraction experiments. And then we will do some actual hands-on experiments again in interference and diffraction okay so this is the content of the lab okay. all the information required for this course will be uploaded in moodle so you should be registered on that i'm running two courses in parallel here so if you're in the ug course send me an email and i'll ensure you're uh, registered in the other course because i'll upload all the information in one course and we don't have any one book specifically for this course. So as and when necessary, I'll upload material. Uh, the lecture notes will also be available. But the books that we will be using are optics by, I will be using as reference, uh, primarily the first three books, which are all optics or optical engineering books. The latter two are meant more for reference and just for one or two topics. You're not restricted to using these books. Any basic book on optics will cover a good part of the first part of the course or any book on lens design. Okay, and as and when required, I will also give you suitable reference material during the course. Okay. The evaluation uh, scheme for this course is we will have one mid-semester exam for 20 marks. There's a lab and there will be assignments and together 
that will be 20 marks. We will have a mini project which I will talk about in later uh, in greater detail later on. So that will also be 20 marks and then an end semester exam for 40 marks. Okay. okay. Already answered this question why study optics as a separate subject, but I just wanted to show you some more applications. So this slide has some images of various applications. This top picture has an uh, image of a retina taken with an optical tomographic system. So if you go into any fairly big hospital today, at least in a big city or town, they will have what is called an OCT system. It is a non-destructive way of studying your eye, which is a good thing, you do not want to destroy your eye. Um, and you can see, you can very nicely see the different layers of the retina. It is used as a diagnostic tool, so if there is something wrong in the retina, doctor can see where something is wrong and then maybe also figure out what is wrong. Below that is a picture of a vena and it has been set into vibration, so some string of the vena has been plucked and what you see are interference patterns, so this is the wave nature of light being used and these interference patterns would change depending upon which string of the vena was plucked. Now this is this result is was pulled out of a study that was done on Indian musical instruments. There are a lot of studies that have been done on western musical instruments and how they vibrate, what uh, the frequency content is and so on. So this was a similar study being carried out for Indian musical instruments. In fact, it, this one was done by somebody in the physics department here. The point to note is the vena is a fairly large instrument, about so big. And this entire instrument is being studied at one go. And this technique, this vibration analysis technique is actually used to study very large surfaces and to get information about these surfaces simultaneously. So a good example is people use it to study an aeroplane wing. Now you know they have to do very rigorous tests on such um, devices or I should not call it a device on such parts of the aeroplane because you need to continually monitor whether there is any damage. So you have to monitor before something happens, well before something happens. Now how do you monitor such a large device? If you have some a, a system that scans, it would take a very long time to scan an entire aeroplane wing or surface of the entire aeroplane. You want to quickly look at it and then narrow down on the point where there seems to be an issue. And if there was an issue, if there was a problem, if there was a defect, this fringe pattern would have some strange behavior and then you can narrow down and study that in greater detail. So it would, it quickly tells them a place where there is a potential problem, okay. And the aeroplane business as you know, they do not want their planes down for a long period of time. It, it, needs to be up and running for as long as possible. So the down times even just for checking has to be shortened. So having a method by which to quickly check a large area makes it more economic for them. Okay. I have also put this telescope here because that is one of the standard applications people always think of as is the microscope. Uh, the bridge over here is put because you can lay fiber optic cables which have gratings in them. You send light down this and the gratings will reflect one wavelength and the wavelength that is reflected changes depending on the stress and strain that the grating sees which depends on the stress and strain that the bridge is seeing. So again you are monitoring a very large system, you can monitor a building, you could monitor a bridge, a railway track, you can monitor these very long, very large structures and quickly find out if there is something wrong and fix it before a disaster happens. So this is called structural health monitoring. Okay? So there is a lot of research going on in that. Th this particular example uses fiber optics, but for the l most part of this course we will actually discuss free space optics. The example in the middle down here is a pulse oximeter, so 
it's clipped onto a person's hand you might have seen it if you visited someone in hospital or if you watch movies there's always someone lying in bed with this clipped on their hand and it measures the pulse rate as well as the oxygen level in the blood um, again you might not looking at it think this is an optical device but it is an optical device and we will cover that in more detail in this course okay so this is just a snapshot of a few of the places optics gets used i have listed out here a, a more comprehensive list again just to emphasize the importance of optics and how much it affects us or impacts us in our everyday life although we might be unaware of it okay okay any questions till now no okay so i'm going to switch to the next part uh, we'll start looking at geometric optics now geometric optics was well understood even 400 years ago people knew that if they used a certain surface or a transparent material of a certain shape they could change the way light traveled what was not understood was why that happened that understanding came much later right but mirrors have been found in archaeological digs from many centuries ago so people had shaped and fashioned mirrors and used them we know microscopes and telescopes were invented again centuries ago and have been used so the lenses were made the why of these elements came much later people understood the first understanding came with certain laws they again they didn't understand why these laws were true but they found out these laws were true and they were able to use these laws and therefore fashion these devices so i'm going to start by listing out some of the postulates of geometric optics okay no proofs for them proofs were uh, uh, come arrived at later on through other means but when these were used there were no proofs for them the good thing or the nice thing about geometric optics is that it works for a lot of devices it's a simple way of tracing light that's basically what we're doing we're going to trace light that's the first step the second step we're going to say is what element should i have such that light travels a certain part and carries out a certain function for me and keeping it very simple keeping the maths very minimum i'm able to actually develop fairly sophisticated systems and so we use geometric optics even though we don't need the full understanding for it because it works okay so what does geometric optics not explain it can explain things like how light bends so I, un, I know if I put a mirror, I know where the reflected light will go. I know the direction it's going to take. So it will tell me things like directions or it will tell me the path. So this is, it tells me this. What it does not tell me, so it does not provide information on how much light takes a, goes in a certain direction so for example i could be standing in front of a glass window and i'm looking out now that means somehow light is traveling through this glass window but i can also see a reflection of myself maybe not a very good reflection but i see a reflection that means some light is being reflected geometric optics I could use geometric optics and say from where I'm standing I expect to see a reflection here I understand how light is traveling from outside to inside but I don't know from geometric optics what is the amount of light that goes into the reflected light how much gets transmitted I cannot tell anything about the quantities we have applications where we have thin layers of film on glasses so if you wear glasses when you buy your glasses they might ask you do you want a coating what coating do you want on it now that coating is called an anti-reflection coating 
glass it is to make sure that most of the light that incident on the glass travels through the glass and reaches your eye if a lot of it reflects it's not reaching your eye and it's that much less light coming to you so you don't want to lose that light so you put an anti reflection coating you cannot explain an anti reflection coating behavior by geometric optics at all you cannot say why reflection doesn't happen geometric optics says reflection happens it can never explain why reflection does not happen okay so you definitely need wave optics to explain certain phenomena okay an example is the anti reflection coatings there are many of course So let's start with some postulates. The first postulate is what people observed long ago is that light travels in straight lines. Now, it's not correct to end the sentence here because does light always travel in straight lines no matter what when would it deviate from the path so you say if, if there's a different refractive index so i'll make it more general i'll say light travels in straight lines in a homogeneous medium in a medium of constant refractive index we'll come to the point refractive index so light travels in straight lines in a homogeneous medium and since you brought up the point of refractive index let's put that down as our second postulate every and i'll keep it simple for this course i'm going to say every dielectric medium has a parameter known as refractive index associated with it okay it's defined usually it's given the the letter n and it is defined as the velocity of light in free space divided by the velocity of light in that particular medium that it's traveling the way i've written it here it means n is a constant in a some medium and the light is traveling with velocity v in that medium but of course n could also be a function of space i could have n of x y and that means that the refractive index is varying in the medium medium is not homogeneous if i look back at the first postulate this tells me that if there's an interface light travels in a straight line in the first medium so let's say i have n1 and n2 light travels in a straight line here but when it reaches the second medium something happens it need not be a straight line anymore something happens and it bends i'm drawing some arbitrary direction now and in that medium it will travel in a straight line again as long as this has constant refractive index n right how exactly it bends we will look at okay okay the now you could also ask where does this idea of refractive index come from okay and a, a simple way of looking at it is to think of every medium having atoms and molecules and you can imagine that or, or you can rather think of the electron cloud around these atoms and molecules right and you can imagine this cloud has is connected through a set of springs so why do you have refractive index right now when the light is incident on this
the electron cloud gets set into oscillation. The analogy, the reason we put those springs in there is to say it need not get in set into oscillation with the same frequency in every direction, which is why you have materials which will have different refractive indices in different directions, right. This sets it into oscillation and then it re-radiates. There is no absorption, nothing is happening, it just gets re-radiated at the same frequency. But this whole process has slowed down the light and that is why there is this concept of refractive index. And you can again take this analogy of the springs and say if the spring constants are stronger, it would slow it down even further. And that is why some materials slow down light more than others, right. In addition, you will have materials where there is some atomic resonance with the frequency that is incident and it may absorb and that is what gives us color because certain wavelengths absorb and then what remains and comes out combines and gives us a certain color, right. So this very simple picture can explain, can be used to help understand a lot of the everyday phenomena that we are seeing, okay. But that is just a little background as to why refractive index comes. We are not going to go into detail here. We are instead going to use this idea of refractive index and say when light travels, what is important is optical path length. So, we are used to worrying about the distance travelled by something, but when light travels it turns out it is not just the physical distance that is important, but some other parameter. And to give you an example, let us look at a case where you have a block of let us say glass of refractive index n and thickness d n and you have a beam of light that is incident on the glass and beyond the glass. Now in the time t, it takes to travel through this glass with velocity v. The same beam of light would have travelled further in air because it got slowed down in glass. So it would have travelled a distance d air with velocity c. So this optical path length is nothing but the distance corresponding to d air which is c by v d n or in other words the refractive index. Now in ray optics we leave it at that. There is a parameter called optical path length, it is the refractive index into the physical length travelled. But when you move on to wave optics you will understand this gets used because it changes the phase of the wave and you know that in wave optics say how does a wave travel well a lot of a lot of control of how the wave travels lies in the phase of the wave and you can see the optical path length is playing around with the phase of the wave okay okay so in in electromagnetics if i write out a wave plane wave equation, I will have E naught E to the power j k x k z minus omega t, right. This is the amplitude and this whole term is the phase and you can see this controls the if, if I if it travels through distance z, the phase is changing. So the phase is telling you how the wave is propagating. And in that k actually lam n is appearing, k is nothing but the wave number which is 2 pi by lambda and in a medium it is lambda by n, right. So this path length is actually playing a role here in the phase of the wave. While I said in geometric optics we cannot explain, we do not explain how much, why, uh, how a certain quantity of light is reflected and a certain quantity is refracted. In wave optics I can explain exactly why that happens. 
concepts. You go to Maxwell's equations and you can take those equations, you can apply boundary conditions and you can explain why the quantities are there. You can predict, you can calculate exactly how much light is going to get reflected or refracted based on the boundary conditions. So in geometric optics, we just say this is the direction it's going to go. Okay, and you you're not going into that depth. Okay. Okay. So that brings me to the fourth postulate, and it's a law or a principle called Fermat's principle. Okay. Fermat's principle states that light travels from one point to another along the path of least time. Or you could think, you could say maybe I could also say therefore that is the shortest path. Okay. We are now, when we say path, we mean the optical path length. So, we are saying the rate of change, oh sorry, I want to write it. The rate of change of the optical path length is 0. And when I write it like this, you could ask, well, this could be either a minimum or a maximum. Okay. Now, okay, before I go down that, let me again explain what I mean here. Light travels from one point to another point along the path of least time. So, let us say I had two media and I have a source here and you know light has reached this point here. So, you, you, you have a source here and you know the light has reached this point. Now, you could ask what is the path it took? That is what this principle is answering. It could travel like this, sorry. It could travel like this, it could travel like this and it could travel in an infinite number of other paths but it travels along a particular path. How do we decide that path? Now, I know if it is one medium and I was going from here to here, we know it is travelling in the straight line. We said light travels in straight line. So, it is all these postulates are linked and that is the shortest path because if I did this clearly a longer path, that is not the path that light takes. People did not understand why light travels like this, but they saw that it does. It travels from one point to another on the path of least time. But when you write out the equation as I have done, this could refer to a maximum path or a minimum path. And it turns out in our everyday occurrences, in our everyday phenomena, it is always the minimum. But when light bends around a planet due to gravity, it actually takes the maximum path. So, Fermat's principle is valid even there when light bends due to gravity. Now, that is not a phenomena that we are encountering every day. So, it is not something that people arrived at naturally. Okay, that realization came much, much later, but it is an interesting point to note that it sometimes does take the maximum path if light is bending due to gravity. Okay. Now, how can I use Fermat's principle? Let us start with a very simple example. Again, I will draw what I had drawn over here. Let us have an interface. The moment I say interface, it means that I have one medium here and another medium here. I have a point of light source here and what I want to do is I am saying it has traveled like this. So, from S it has traveled to P through this point O the normal to the surface is drawn here and in optics we always indicate angles as the angle between the ray and the normal to the surface. So, this is the incident angle, this is the transmitted angle and let us to help us calculate, let us give the height here, 
this distance let's say is x this distance is b this distance is a okay i think i have all my points the path length is n i s o plus n t o p I want to use Fermat's principle. So, I want to take the path of least time. So, I am going to write out the time. When I write out the time, then I have to take the physical distance into account. So, I have S O by V i plus O p by V t. V i and V t are the velocity in those respective media. I want to minimize the time. So, I am going to take d t by and now I have to decide what variable to minimize it with. We are trying to find out the path it is taking. So, if it had travelled through some other path in this figure that I have drawn, right, that variable x would have changed, that x would change. So, I am going to minimize this with respect to x, because if it, if the location of O was different, x would be different. And O would be in a different place if it had taken a different path. Okay. So, if I carry out this, so let me write out S O is nothing but H squared plus X squared to the power half by B i plus O P is B squared plus A minus X the whole squared to the power half by v t. And now, I am going to minimize this. Let us do it a little lower down. So, I carry out this differentiation. a minus sign there. Right. And we want this part to be minimized. So, we are setting this equal to 0. So, if I do that, what we will left with is x over v i h squared plus x squared root of equal to 2 a minus x v t b squared plus a minus x the whole squared root of. What is x divided by h squared plus x squared? Sorry. in that figure. So, this is nothing but sin theta i by v i equal to sin theta t by v t. And if I multiply this by velocity of light in free space, I can now write this in terms of the refractive index of each of these media. And what have we arrived at? Very, very well known what you have been doing from school Snell's law of, but Snell's law, Snell's law of refraction, right. If we take Fermat's principle as true, and we do this derivation, we arrive at Snell's law. Now, you can ask why is Fermat's principle true? And as I said before, if you go back to Maxwell's equations and boundary conditions, you can prove Snell's law again using those equations and that math and you will understand why it is true. So, you can consider Fermat's principle as a shortcut.
to calculating calculating or demonstrating the wave nature without having to go through maxwell's equations you are able to arrive at something so it's a, it's a shortcut okay okay uh, you can use Fermat's principle to show the law of reflection which is theta i is equal to theta r ok we would not do that here right and I will end this now with a nice analogy. So, if you think of so this and uh, it is an analogy for this law. Imagine you have a swimmer, uh, sorry, a lifeguard, and the lifeguard is on the beach, medium one, and there is someone drowning over here. Okay, so this is water. Now, of course, the aim of the lifeguard is to reach this person who is drowning as fast as possible. Now, what does the lifeguard do? He has to choose a path. The path involves both running and swimming. Now, the lifeguard may be a faster runner than a swimmer. So, as it makes sense to choose the longest path or this let me say rather than this sorry. Should he choose the longest path running and then swim the shortest path, but he is He's, he still has to swim that much distance, but he is running much more now or say no we would not do this let him run this distance and swim this distance, but then he is swimming a much longer path. What path should he choose and what Fermat's principle is letting us arrive at is what is the optimum path considering that in one medium there is one velocity and another medium there is another velocity. If I optimize and say well he is very fast runner let him run more, but you are making him run really a lot more. Even if you say he is a faster swimmer you the same problem occurs there you are making him swim a lot more. So, what is the optimum path and Snell's law basically is helping us arrive at that optimum path. The amazing thing is, is that is how light sorry that is how light travels. It finds that optimum path in any situation and it travels ok. So, it is an it is a nice analogy to Snell's law ok. So, that is all for this class and we will continue in the next class with a little more on geometric optics. Mm -hmm.